Hi, welcome our panel. Welcome to our panel, New Beijing. We thank all of you for coming here to see our presentations. My name is Nobu Tsujimura, a panel chair and presenter of this panel. Today, we have three unique talks from Japan, India, and Qatar. As a, as a chair, I want to extend my appreciation to two other presenters. Estarshan from India, so he is right now absent, but I, he may be coming here later. And, and Spencer Stryker from Qatar. Now, um, amazingly, it is 4 a.m. in Qatar. So I guess it is still during midnight before sunrise. So thank you indeed, Spencer Stryker, for attending here in such early times. No problem. My pleasure to be here. Yeah, me too. So this panel, New Vision, will last for two hours. So from now, I will allocate roughly 30 minutes to each presenter, including related cues and A's. So after every presentation, we will have some 10 to 15 minutes, if possible, uh, for cues and A's. And please ask questions by the Q&A icon and make comments by the chat icon. And after all of this, we can use the remaining time for open discussion. Okay, anyway, the first presentation is mine and I'm now sharing my PDF. Right. I'm Nobu Tsujimura, big historian in Japan. Until this month, I served as a board member of the IBHA for six years. Here, I want to expand, ex extend my deep gratitude to Barry Rodrigue, who nominated me as a candidate for a new board member six years ago. I'm now free grateful for that. I got experience essential to the rest of my life. And this April, I became adjunct lecturer at JF Oberlin University, Tokyo, and began to teach three big history courses there. Because this is a first experience for me to teach something. I've been crazily busy preparing for my classes every week. To be honest, that consumed most of my time and reduced my sleep time. So today my talk is an initial note for one of my research agendas that is its result. Today I talk about two things. First, making big history much cultural. Then second, making big history much natural. My thoughts on both started by visiting Mexico. In December 2016, Professor Hirofumi Katayama at Oberlin and his three students and I held a big history seminar along with COP 13 in Cancun, Mexico. And it was fortunate for me there we could see well-known political scientist, Kinhide Mushakoji. And we had a very nice conversation there. Then after returning to Japan, I sent an email of appreciation to him. And then he replied and in it, so he mentioned the need for making big history much civilizational. So 
So,、um, inspiring by his words, Hirofumi Hiro Katayama and I emphasize the need for making big history multi civilizational in our co authored article in 2017. A big history, David Christian once said, big history is a modern creation myth.、Um, in the Western context, That idea can be seen as an extension of the Enlightenment because, as historian Roy Porter says, what philosophers, Enlightenment thinkers essentially did was to replace a Christian myth with a scientific myth. And then、uh, this is a criticism from Hiro Katayama. So, Western big history considers The history of the universe as an anthropocentric history of evolution, where human beings of the modern era are placed at the highest state of complexity or evolution. And which leads to this respect for traditional wisdom of indigenous people and ancient cultures as superstition of losers in the history. So, if we want to make big history truly, Universal. We must learn from non Western values and traditions. That's my opinion. And making big history multi civilizational. Then, after that,、um, David, reading our article,、uh, David Christian、uh, sent us counter arguments on some points, and we exchanged some long emails. And in it,、uh, he also gave us nice advice because civilization usually means large civilization with states and cities. It leads to excluding indigenous people, so indigenous people's culture and communities. So hereafter, I changed that label from. Multi civilizational to multi cultural. And then,、um, Kinhi de Musha Koj also kindly respond to, responded to our co authored article. And in his email,、uh, he emphasized that an evolutionist view that animism. Was overcome by actual religions, and then actual religions were overcome by science, is completely misguided. And he has a keen interest in seeking wisdom for survival in animism, and he expects me to give a big twist to such a view by reversing it. So here, Reverse means actual religion, like Christianity, so he is one of the Catholic. So, actual religion has something、um, deep, something、uh, superior to science. And then, animism has something deeper and something superior to actual religion. That's the meaning of big twist. But At that time, I did not understand the full implication of what he meant. So, honestly, it took me for a few more years to notice the implication of his words. But fortunately, through exchanges of progressive anthropologists in Japan, I can be more aware of what he meant little by little. In recent years, there has been a growing trend of attributing personhood to animal, other animals. Why? It may seem obvious to people who own dogs or cats, these animals have cognitive abilities and emotions such as joy and sadness, and they can perceive human emotions too, and they have different personalities and their own agencies. More people recognize these aspects, 
there is a wider movement opposing to the confinement of other animals for the purpose of patterning them up with food, causing them suffering, abusing them, or killing them for consumption. Creatures that were once seen as pre-human are becoming more human-like. On the other hand, the idea of artificial intelligence and robots acquiring personhood is also becoming gradually more realistic. So we may soon reach a time, I don't know exactly when, but when humans fall in love with humanoid robots or when humanoids themselves engage in romantic relationship as shown Icelandic singer Björk's music video for All is Full of Love. The existence that were once seen as post-human are approaching humanity. In this context, in this transformation, the boundaries that once seem to separate humans from non-humans are becoming broad. So humanity is now in question from both the perspective of pre-humans and post-humans. Interestingly, the human perspective and worldviews of postmodernity, the postmodern perspectives on human and world are converging with pre-modern animistic views on humans and world in which uh, that recognize personhood and souls even in animals and objects. The worldviews of indigenous peoples, which were once discarded as backward or pre-modern, are now turn now turns out to be, in a sense, progressive or postmodern. Then next. So while it may seem natural now that the entire planet shares the same era, it wasn't always the case. In the 19th century West, 19th century West it was so that modernity was achieved only by the West and limited number of countries, while other regions were considered to be stuck in pre-modern stages of development. So you can see um, there are different times at the same time. And it was believed that different epochs coexisted on the same planet. They were like parallel worlds. And disciplines, uh, fields of studies, were once divided by it, their developmental stages. I remember that in cultural anthropology course I took at university, uh, anthropology professor explained me that anthropologists traveling to non-Western regions for research had a sense of traveling back in time as if using a time machine. According to that lecture, a British anthropologist, Edward Tyler, had a linear view of development with Western modernity at its peak. But the title of his book, Primitive Culture, which aimed to demonstrate that culture existed among people deemed as savages, was quite shocking at that time. It was believed that uncivilized people lacked enough culture to be recognized. Over time, with reflection on racism and colonialism, the attitude of looking down on different cultures as inferior became a thing of the past. However, 
even when expressing respect for different cultures, the attitude remained within the framework of cultural relativism. There was no hierarchy among cultures, but each group had its own culture. Yeah, that's good. Even though they had no intention of changing or letting go of their own culture, thus perpetuating the status quo. However, some anthropologists ventured further. Could it be that what they are saying is literally true? What kind of world would we see if we took their words not as misperceptions or not as metaphors, but seriously? Taking seriously is a motto for these progressive anthropologists. By taking seriously what indigenous people say, anthropologists notice futuristic or progressive nature of their worldview that acknowledges the presence of personality and soul in animals, plants, and objects. As a result, an unseen landscape emerges, revealing that what was once thought to be exclusive to humans is actually not. This awareness made these anthropologists try to construct anthropology beyond the human realm. Even though it involves studying non-humans, why is this still considered anthropology? Perhaps it is because humanity, a kind of agency, ability of perception can also reside in animal, plants, and objects. Anthropologists notice that just as focusing only on Japan doesn't lead to understanding, a good understanding, full understanding of Japan, focusing only on human doesn't lead to understanding human. Here, uh, I want to introduce you one famous anthropologist from Brazil. Ribeiros de Castro rejects multiculturalism, cultural relativism, and instead advocates for multinationalism. While multiculturalism sees humans as looking at the world through different spirits within, um, and they see the same one nature through different spirits, so that these two different culture, different interpretation. Why March naturalism argues that both humans and other animals see the world through the same one spirit, but through different bodies. That leads to conception of different appearances of nature. The main idea here is that nature is not one, but many. Not in terms of interpretation culture, but in terms of appearances, a physical form or related perception. This is because even though there is a universal com or common spirit or a kind of humanity, it perceives the world through diverse bodies. Therefore, there are many manifestations of nature. The notion that there are multiple manifestations of nature doesn't simply refer to the fact that there are diverse ecosystems and climates on Earth. Rather, for example, if a grassland appears green to humans, but appears a different color to a butterfly, that can see colors human can perceive. Then both the green grassland and differently colored grassland exist and 
They are both true. They are both real. Nature is not something that can be understood solely from the perspective of humans. It also includes the perspective of non-human animal, plants, and even objects, including telescopes and microscopes. Without taking into account the nature that can be seen from various different bodies, the true essence cannot be perceived. Hence, nature exists and can be understood as a composite of these various appearances. Nature is not singular, but plural. So it is discovered only when we pay attention to plurality of nature that different organisms perceive different ways. That is March naturalism. That being said, I do not see much cultural approach and much natural approach, uh, much cultural approach and much natural approach are conf confrontational, like Viveros de Castro says. His comparison looks a bit extreme and oversimplified. Yes, all the living organisms perceive inner and outer environment to survive, but the way and the mode of their perceptions can vary each other. So they have different consciousness or perceptions, even if we can find connection in terms of evolution. So we can adapt both marriage cultural and marriage natural approaches. Here, my take and the crucial implication for big history is that we may construct another big history narrative, other kinds of big history narratives seen not only from humans, but also from other living species. So what looks like big history seen from trees or big history seen from stones? That's another frontier that enables us to get out of mere human centuries. And that, and that can flower new creativity, all forms of expression, including digital apps or games, what Spencer Stryker has engaged in by making big history much cultural and much natural. We can expect we can enjoy big history more. It's a joy, a joy of living. And it's an essential part of great transformation of world views and relations. How we see the world, how we relate to the world. We can enjoy it. We can make it together. Thank you.